this opening passage in the book of Ecclesiastes is really important for us to get our heads around. Uh, the series that I'm going through in Ecclesiastes I've called If Only, and the talk I did on this section I called If Only I Could Gain Something. If you are new to this channel, I encourage you to subscribe, like this video, share it with those who you think you would find it helpful. If you haven't already done so, take some time to read through these 11 verses for yourself a number of times. Uh, the most important tool in digging into a passage like this is reading and rereading, just to familiarize yourself with the text. And take some time to pray and ask God to help you to understand His Word, uh, this very important book of Ecclesiastes. And as always, I'm going to just highlight just some of what I've seen in this opening section. So we start here with the words of the teacher. And a lot of ink has been spilt over trying to work out exactly who this teacher is. Uh, the words of the teacher, son of David. Uh, that has made many say they're sure that it's Solomon, uh, king of Jerusalem. And many biblical scholars, uh, many Christians over the years have gone with Solomon as the author to this text, but there is debate around that. There's lots in the book itself that uh, suggests that life isn't as good as it was in Jerusalem during Solomon's days. Um, the whole enigmatic nature of the world that the teacher observes doesn't fit so neatly with the world of Solomon. Uh, so some say it seems like it wasn't uh, Solomon himself and uh, the next passage in Ecclesiastes he says that um, he had more wisdom than the kings before him and that also seems to suggest a line of kings before Solomon where uh, there wasn't a line of kings before him there was only Saul and his father David who were kings before him in Jerusalem so there's lots of evidence uh, that seems to contradict the uh, idea that it was Solomon as uh, the writer of this book, but the reality is he doesn't tell us his name. So I think it's fine for us just to rest that God in his wisdom didn't give us the name of this writer of the book and we can rest in that and trust that this is God's word to us. And so the teacher starts with the famous beginning of Ecclesiastes, uh, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless everything is meaningless and that we're going to see repeated 38 times that word is repeated in the book of Ecclesiastes 38 times now this word meaningless is the the Hebrew word hevel and meaningless or uh, even vanity all of these translations aren't uh, that accurate. The idea behind the word meaningless is it's like a vapor. Um, you can't grab hold of it. Uh, so an English word that's maybe as close as enigmatic is something you can't quite get your head around. And that's what we'll see in this whole book of Ecclesiastes is that as he observes life, he sees that he can't quite get his head around the purpose of life here under the sun and so this uh, repeated idea of being under the sun is also one that uh, comes many times in the book of ecclesiastes 29 times we are told about uh, life under the sun or toil under the sun labor under the sun all of these things being done under the sun and this is life from the perspective of this world it's a horizontal perspective of life and as he observes this life under the sun, he's saying it is enigmatic. It's hard to get your head around the big overall purpose for life under the sun. Now, by the time we get to the end, chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes, he's going to say, here's the conclusion, fear God. That's how you make sense of life under the sun. But in this opening passage, God is absent. God isn't mentioned in these opening 11 verses. And the key question that uh, Mr. Teacher is dealing with in this opening section is here in verse 3, what do people gain? What is there to be gained?
from all our labors. So that's also another important word in Ecclesiastes, toil or labor. Uh, that word is, is used 23 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And what is to be gained, the idea of gaining, is used eight times. So there's a, a lot of repetition uh, in this book. He, he's trying a whole lot of things to try and find meaning. But the key question here in this opening section is what do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? And from just this poem that follows in verses 4 to 11, the answer that Mr. Teacher wants us to see is that you gain nothing. You gain nothing from all your toils under the sun. See, generations come and go. Uh, the NIV has translated this come and go, but actually it should be generations go and generations come. That's, that's the way it is in the Hebrew. Uh, one generation goes, the next one replaces it. Um, the wind blows. Round and round it goes, all the streams flow, they return to the place where they come from. Uh, there's a whole lot of this repetitive, the ebb and flow of life in this world. Uh, these uh, four to seven are very much kind of a, a focus on uh, the world as we know it. So under the sun, he also looks at the sun and says so day by day, the sun rises and the sun sets, it hurries back to where it rises from. And generations come and go. The wind blows north and south. The streams flow into the sea, but the sea is never full. And as he observes this ebb and flow, what that leaves him feeling is weary. Now verse 8 here is the heart of this poem. Uh, so the question that he's trying to deal with is, what do people gain? Uh, the ebb and flow of the world we live in makes him feel like we gain nothing. Then as he observes human life in this world, he also seems like we gain nothing. All things are wearisome, more than we can say. So it's almost a restatement or picking up some of these uh, ideas from the question in verse 3. What has been will be done it will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. So what do people gain from their toil under the sun? There's nothing new. It just continues on and on and on. This repetitive uh, nature of life under the sun. What's the point? Is very much what the teacher is getting at here. What is the point? It's just the same old, same old. The sun comes up, the sun rises, the sun sets. Uh, and then he goes, is there anything of which one can say it's new? Well, no, it's just new ways of uh, looking at the world and listening to things in the world. There, there's ultimately nothing new under the sun. And then at the end of this play and repeat life, no one remembers the former generation. They will not be remembered by those who follow them. So it really does feel like Mr. Teacher is it's like a dreary Monday morning. The sun may have risen, but it's behind the clouds. It's dreary and rainy. And he's just trying to make sense of life in this world. And he observes things under the sun. And it just leaves him feeling weary. As I said, this opening section, uh, has, God is conspicuous by his absence. And so the big thing that Mr. Teacher wants us to see is that apart from God, people gain nothing from all their toil. And that's kind of the heart of these opening 11 verses. It's all meaningless. It's enigmatic. You can't make sense of why do we work so hard? Everybody's just working so hard. The world of his day was much like the world of our day. People are just in the rat race, working hard. And he's just saying, but, but what do you gain? What's the point? In the end, you die and nobody even remembers you. Uh, and those yet to come won't be remembered by those who follow them. So why do we work so hard? Apart from God, people gain nothing from all their toil. 
Now we know that as we go through this book, he's going to give us a more hopeful perspective. But in this opening passage, he doesn't give us that. He actually leaves us in the depths. He's saying kind of it is all, all meaningless. It's enigmatic. We can't grab hold of this play and repeat life in this world. And as you observe it as one under the sun, it just leaves him feeling weary. That's the, the heart of this passage. But what is going to move him from observing this enigmatic life, move him from weariness to wonder? What is it that's going to change his perspective? Now, we have to come at this passage as New Testament readers of the text. So Christ has to inform the way that we read this passage. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, gives us a helpful corrective where um, in verse 58 we are told that those who labor in the Lord do not labor in vain. For your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that is uh, flowing out of this glorious passage all about the resurrection, showing that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It even changes the way that we toil under the sun. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. So if you labor apart from God, you will gain nothing. Our Lord Jesus even said when he came in Matthew 16, he said, what good is it for somebody to gain the whole world, to gain the whole world, and yet forfeit their soul? Because in the end, they will die. No one will remember them. And if they forfeited their soul by trying to gain the whole world, what good is it? And so as Christians reading this passage, yes, life is enigmatic. But instead of that leaving us feeling weary, we need to pray that God would give us a better perspective so that life here under the sun, as we toil and labor in our hard work, because we should be working hard, how instead of being left feeling weary, can life in this world grow our wonder? Well, we need God to change our perspective. And we need to be reminded that those who labor in the Lord don't labor in vain. And so this opening passage of Ecclesiastes speaks so uh, strongly into our materialistic, um, driven world that wants to just get and get and get, the chasing the American dream. He says, actually chasing the American dream, toiling under the sun for that, in the end you gain nothing. And nobody will remember you when you're gone. And so this passage really challenges uh, that foundation that our world operates on and says to us as Christians, you need to operate on a whole different foundation. You need to operate on the foundation of Christ. That is what will make your life not meaningless. That is what will make your labor not in vain. Uh, as you look at the play and repeat nature of our world, if you don't want it to leave you feeling weary, but rather to grow your wonder, you need to look at the world uh, from the perspective of a Christian. The God who made the sun came in the man Jesus to live under the sun, to redeem us as those who are living under the sun. Uh, our toil, our work is toil because of the fall. Genesis 3 shows us that we will, by the sweat uh, of our brow will we work the land. Our work is toil because it's cursed, but Jesus came to reverse the curse. That doesn't mean that life and our work here under the sun now won't still be hard. It will be hard. But if we've been saved by Jesus, uh, we are not working apart from God, but rather for him. And so our labor is not in vain. So as we deal with this section, we really need to see the depths to which he descends as he, as he observes life under the sun. But we also need to read it as Christians, knowing that God has given us great purpose as those who have been redeemed by him. And so as you dig into this passage further, uh, use this passage for, to reflect on the world we live in, uh, this play and repeat world. But instead of that driving you crazy, let it grow your wonder at the God who has set this world up in place, the God who has created good work for you to do. 
because only those who have been saved by Jesus will toil under the sun in a way that truly counts. As you dig in further, I pray that this passage will actually really encourage you to see that yes, life is enigmatic, but for those who labor in the Lord, their labor is not in vain. Well, God bless as you dig in further.